I'd like to say hello and to welcome everyone to our October webinar, the second part on loan monitoring, focusing on tools for effective management. And many of you were with us last time, um, so thanks so much for those who are returning and welcome to those individuals who are joining us for the first time. We're lucky to have Donna Nails present this second session with us, and so she'll be leading us throughout the session today. And my name is Jessica Alfaro. Uh, I've met many of you in person, and I'm, I'm happy to speak to uh, many of you for the first time today as well. I'm a manager at Capital Plus Exchange, and thank you so much for joining us. So a little bit more about Donna. Ms. Nails is an independent consultant specializing in domestic and international development finance and a senior banker with Capital Plus Exchange. She is regularly called on to conduct operational and financial audits for international finance companies and to structure and recommend risk management practices. Ms. Nails has been an analyst for ARIS, formerly known as CAR, since its inception in 2005 Connecting, conducting analysis on community development financial institutions in the areas of capitalization, asset quality, liquidity, earnings, management, and impact for investors and donors. Ms. Nails served as the Deputy Director of Corporate Risk Management at Shore Bank Corporation from 2003 to 2005, and she also spent two years in the Business Banking Department of Shore Bank as a commercial lender and loan officer. And That's why she's um, so great to be presenting this because she's had experience uh, among the different range of, of positions um, in the field as a loan officer and also on the credit risk side. Prior to working at Shorebank, Ms. Nails worked over four years as an international de economic development specialist, uh, and her specific, ex her specific experience includes overseeing a budget for SME projects in Ukraine, Moldova, and Belarus. So at this point in time, I will turn it over to Donna. Thank you, Jessica. Um, well, welcome to everybody, and especially to those people who were at my webinar last month, where where we just talked, if everyone will remember, or maybe I'll let the other people who weren't there know, we were just talking about good and best practices and some bad practices in um, loan monitoring, kind of talking about uh, how it should be done. But this webinar, I wanted to be able to talk to you about tools, and we will cover monitoring policies, forms, and talk a bit about tracking, um, how management can actually track if your loan officers or business development officers or collection officers are actually monitoring. And some of the tools we're, I'm going to be showing, we will, Jessica will be sending out hopefully this weekend. Um, yes, she will probably send them out this weekend. I have to get them to her. Uh, and so, and if there's anything that you have a question on afterwards, you could always email Jessica or, and she can let me know and we can talk about it. So what my goal of this session is to talk about what I've seen in the field in good management tools for monitoring. And as Jessica said, I was a loan officer for a number of years and then I went into the credit risk management side and specifically was looking a lot at loan reviewing, going out and looking at loans, meeting with clients. So I have a gamut of experience and I've seen really very, very good practices and I've seen absolutely horrible practices. So that's why um, I enjoy doing this because I like to share all my information and even talk about when I was a loan officer. So let's begin. First, let's have a question. Where do your loan officers document their monitoring calls or visits? Do they do it in the MIS system? Do they do it on a paper that is in a file, hopefully the loan file? Uh, on, on a paper that's somewhere in the loan officer's desk, or is it in their heads? So I will let Jessica take it away. Great, so this will be our, our first poll, and so we wanna get a sense of, of where your loan officers are documenting um, any monitoring calls or visits that they're doing. So um, please select one, so whether or not that's in your MIS reporting system that you have, um, a paper file somewhere in the loan file, 
um, on a paper that's somewhere in their desk or if they're they're keeping that in their head and the information is there. So that poll is open and um, please choose one. We uh, have uh, a number of people who voted and uh, if we could keep this open for about 20 more seconds as we can see a few more people um, voting as well and so we'll keep it open for another um, five seconds or so and we can go ahead and close the poll. So thank you to everyone who uh, mentioned that and the, as we can see uh, about 50% are documenting in the MIS system, 45% are uh, doing it on paper in a file, possibly the loan file, and about 5% are, are keeping the information in their heads. So Donna, I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you. So what is interesting to me about that, um, oops, it, it got kicked out of there, there we go, uh, is that I, um, I was thinking about myself as a loan officer and we had requirements of visiting clients and reporting it. Um, however, it wasn't strictly enforced. So most of the time I'd visit clients and I kept it in my head. Sometimes I would actually document it, but usually that paper was somewhere in my desk because it, I was responsible for filing any of these documents and so it never, sometimes, it never really got to the file. And unfortunately, when I was a loan officer, which is about 15 years ago, we didn't have a strong MIS system. So we didn't even have, I didn't even have the ability to put it in the, our MIS system. So what I was very pleased to see is 50% is in your MIS system. Uh, I see 40% is on paper in the file and I said 5% in your heads. I, I have to say I was quite surprised that many of you are saying it's on paper in the MIS system because unfortunately when I go out and do many loan reviews internationally I find mm, I would say 75% of the time I go and I look at a file I can't and the, you know the closing documents are in there the, the, the copy of the loan agreement, copy of collateral no monitoring comments and I don't find anything in my ass but then I go talk to a loan officer and it's very obvious the loan officer knows their client has been talking to them. Uh, so I would just say that that's great you have an MIS system and on paper and I, I hope that they're not keeping it in their heads like I used to do when I wasn't a good loan officer. So let's talk about the case of the bad loan officer. We had uh, in our webinar last month part one, this is part two. So there was a new loan officer, this is a true story, a new loan officer that was monitoring a large facility, a large loan that was provided to a healthcare center um, and what she would do is have coffee every month with the chief financial officer who was her main contact. The loan officer had a very good relationship with the CFO. They would talk about life, they would talk about things like including her new puppy. So obviously they were friends also. So then one day the loan payment was not made on the loan and the loan officer called the CFO. The CFO informed the loan officer that the healthcare facility, the center, was actually in very bad financial situation. And in fact, I did write this, but because I am the bad loan officer in this situation, they were also, the board was also going to be firing the CEO. So there was change in management, bad financial situation. So the loan officer, who was me, asked the CFO, why did you not tell me? You know, why, what, why, I, why didn't I know? And her answer was, because you never asked me. So <laughs> let's talk about what I, oh, that's me, very angry on the bottom, angry at myself. I learned a lot of things by this. So what, what were the lessons I learned that I've taken forth when I do training and I work with other financial institutions? So one thing is, I would ask her, the CFO, how is work, you know, when we'd meet for our coffee? And she'd say, oh, stressful. But I should have asked more questions. I just kind of let it go, thinking, oh, okay, she had a stressful day. But I should have been inquisitive. I should have tried to figure out why was she having a stressful day? I probably would have found out the, the health care healthcare center was having serious financial situation. And I needed to mix general and pointed questions, including how is your cash flow? 
So what I learned is to ask direct questions. You know, this is something I debate with loan officers when I'm doing training or I'm talking to loan officers all the time. They don't feel comfortable asking those direct questions. How's your cash flow? How much money do you have at the end of the month? How much savings do you have? You know, loan officers reply to me when I tell them, ask direct questions. The loan officers will say to me, oh, well, the client will never give me an honest answer. We don't like, they won't answer that question. And I said, we have, to, we have the right to ask those questions. We are in partnership. We have lent money to the company. So part of my training when I work with loan officers and even branch managers is telling them, we lent them money. We have all the right in the world to ask these questions about their businesses. So again, we have to ask direct pointed questions. And we'll talk more about those direct questions when we're talking about documenting and uh, documenting the monitoring visit. And then the last thing I learned is be careful mixing friendship and business. That was fine that I had a friendship with this CFO. Mm, maybe it wasn't fine, to be quite honest. Maybe you have to put a little distance, as we say, between friendship and business. But I should have also had business calls with her, meaning I should have met, in, I should have met her in the office and talked with her just about business instead of talking about her new pu her puppy. So what I learned was be inquisitive, ask direct questions, and be careful about mixing friendship in business. So, I have another poll question and then we're gonna start in. What is, please select this, which statement is correct for your financial, about your financial institution. My institution has a separate monitoring policy. My institution's monitoring policies are embedded into the credit policy. So a big credit policy, but the monitoring policies are included. My, inst my institution does not address monitoring in any of its policies. So, Jessica? Great. So we have another opportunity, and um, this is helpful information just to get a sense of, of where your institution is and what they're doing. So please choose one of the following. So about your financial institution, <clears throat> do they have a separate monitoring policy? Do they have monitoring policies embedded into the credit policy? Or does your institution not address monitoring in any of its policies? So we'll take uh, about another um, 10 seconds here for this to come in, and we're getting some good responses here. And so we can go ahead and close the poll at this point in time. So the majority of the institutions, the majority of the participants are saying that their institutions have monitoring policies embedded into their credit policy. So around 70% of the participants are telling us this. About 26% of the institutions have a separate monitoring policy and about 4% of the institutions are not addressing monitoring in any of the policies. So Donna, I will turn it back over to you. Thank you. Well, first of all, I want to thank that 4% that said we don't address monitoring in the policy. Um, you know, it's, it's hard to admit areas where, where our institutions are lacking, but if we admit it, then we can work on it. At least some of the information I give today will help you with the policy. Um, I see majority of institutions put their policies inside the credit policy, and about 26% have separate. You know, I. It's a debate. It's a debate which is better, to put your monitoring policy into your credit policy or to have a separate monitoring policy. You know, my preference, what I've seen, but I'm not saying this is perfect, is to have a separate monitoring policy. Just because when I see it embedded in a credit policy, I don't see monitoring policies updated like they should. Many times I go into an institution, before I go to that institution to do either a loan review or training, I read your credit policies. And then I will go out in the field or I talk to loan officers to see is what is in the policy is actually happening in the field. And probably one of the biggest areas I see a big a difference is, is monitoring. You know, institutions, financial institutions are very good at updating like underwriting, collateral, guarantee sections, that's very updated. All you know, I see very good updates to that. And but the, the monitoring seems to fall to the side. So sometimes I think a separate policy 
is not a bad thing. So just you might want to think about that in the future. So let's go on to talk about monitoring policy for new clients. And I'm talking about the good practices I've seen there. So the first thing I cannot say this enough is the verification of the use of funds should be for every new client an absolute that needs to be done um, it should you know and what's best is to kind of do is to do it a first a few days before the first loan loan payment due so then you can remind them their loan payments due and also see that they use the funds for the right way you know because that's you know almost if you do it 28 days from when you disperse the loan, that should have been enough time that they use the funds to buy whatever they needed to buy with or use it for. Um, if you can't see where they use it, sometimes as we know, maybe they were going to pay extra salaries or something, but a lot of times clients are using part of the funds to buy inventory or maybe repairs to a car um, or a new refrigerator for the, the store, um, so we should, we should do that. We should also require invoice and pictures of the use for the larger loans. And the reason I'm saying this is because we need to put that probably even in our loan agreements that they're, if they're going to be buying like fixed assets or, 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 or like um, something like a refrigerator that we tell them, you know what, we're going to need a, an invoice or I'm going to need to take a picture of it if you're buying it, let's say they buy it used. You know, that tells the client off the bat, we're going to be monitoring the way you're using this. And so there's no surprises when the loan officer goes during that first visit and says, oh, so where did you, let me see what you bought. Show me the inventory. Show me the refrigerator. Show me the repairs to the car. I got to tell you, I was at a client and we had a guy that was paying always late. So I went out to visit him uh, and, you know, we're talking to him. He's a taxi driver and he took money to repair the car. So finally I said, okay, this was about seven months and he had a 12 month loan or 18 month loan. So after sitting in his house and he tried to give us tea and it was really nice and he's talking to me about, you know, he loves Chicago where I'm from. I was like, okay, show me where the car is. So finally he showed it to me. He didn't do the repairs. He didn't, he didn't do any repairs to his car that he took our money for. So, you know, I got, you know, very suspicious and I'm wondering where is that money going? But then looking at his lifestyle, I know where it went. He went to pay debts and have a nice, like probably a life that, you know, I, that we were helping pay for. So anyway, you know, we should require the invoice in the pictures and we should tell the clients at the closing we are going to, when we disperse the loans, we are going to go verify where the money went. And we should complete a form or put a note in MIS just saying use of funds verified. Because, and you know this, most of you are credit people, I saw, you know this, and as loan officers know this too, Diversion of funds. If they misuse that money for something else, then we know we're going to have a problem with them because they're not so honest and transparent. With small, small loans, you know, microfinance, we know maybe 10, maybe even 20% of the loan funds will be diverted into something else or may be diverted. And I can, I can, I can say that I can stomach that. I just don't want 80, 90, 100% of my funds. And, you know, this is also, I saw this in one country, you know, I could tell you probably five times out of 10 when I went and they didn't use the funds, what they were doing for it, there was a wedding in the family that they were using the money to pay for. So, Again, we can, we, can, we can be good credit people and we can manage our risk to tell them up front, we're going to verify the use. So I will be there in a few, day, you know, a few days in the next month and we will see where the use is. Ah, I said, I just said, diversion of funds to the different uses, the biggest red flag that your client isn't trustworthy. So let's talk about the ver verification form you know, or the first visit, I would almost call this. You can say, you know, has a loan purpose be fulfilled? Has a loan approval conditions be fulfilled if they were supposed to do anything? Are there any significant changes um, from the first month? You can comment on the stocks if they have like a store. Is the collateral still available? I know this seems like a funny question, but sometimes I have found after going out to visit the client within the first three months that, you know, they've done something to what the collateral was supposed to be. I mean, unless, of course, it was a house or something like that. So it's always a good thing. What has changed since the initial site visit, if there's has anything? Um, are there any problems or issues observed? And what could you do to resolve them? 
Do you need your supervisor's intervention? You know, this is an important question. I remember when I was a loan officer going to visit a client, and, and, and the client was very nervous, very stressed. The business was taking longer. He was opening a pizza restaurant, and the business was taking much longer to open. So when I went to visit him, you know, if the business hadn't started, and I should have, I was pretty new then, and I should have involved my team leader because I think he would have understood right away that this client was going to have cash flow problems, which they did, which they did, which they then had some for about three, I think, or four months significant payment delays, which caused a lot of problems to my 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 par. Um, so I should have invited, I should have told my team leader who should have seen what was happening and we could have thought of how we could handle this. So monitoring policy on new clients. You know, people ask me, okay, Donna, we're going to set up a monitoring policy or we're going to change it. How often should I visit clients? So this is, I'm not saying this is exactly right, but this is what I would recommend. Minimum for new clients, you know, depending on size. Um, bigger clients you want to see more, right? More at risk. But, you know, at least minimum call for the first month and then every two to three days. This is after your first verification, right? We go out the first time, we see that they use the right funds, and maybe for smaller loans, you just you just call. Bigger loans, you might visit every month or every month. Um, you know, call two to three days before the payments due just to check in, uh, and then visit the business premise annually. There shall always, always, always be a visit in the middle. So. What I don't want to hear from loan officers, which is frustrating to me, is that they will only visit the client at the renewal, if it's a 12-month loan or 18-month loan. I said no, once during the loan cycle. Because, you know, things might look better when the client knows you're coming, you know. I had a bakery that um, I'm pretty sure when they knew I was coming, they had all their staff in. And I am pretty sure from their class flow that they were not having they were not fully operational. I don't think from what the sales and from what I saw, they were actually running at full steam. I think they were having clock. But they, when they knew I was coming, unfortunately. Uh, so again, I should have done surprise visits. So visit them annually. One, you have to increase monitoring. Diversion of funds. If you see that they use your funds for something else, then you need to monitor them much more. Now, of course, when you have late payments, um, uh, that's when you would have increased monitoring. Or if you sense something's happening with the client, if they tell you, like like with my business, uh, with, the, with the pizza restaurant, if you see that the cash or the business is starting out slower, then you want to visit them more often. And if, you know, if you can, document it in your MIS system. Papers get lost. We can talk about MIS systems all day, but what I have found is many of you, when I go on site, have very good MIS systems that can be tailored. Uh, when I sit with the IT people, they have the ability to change the MIS system if needed to be able to allow a monitoring um, or an, and collections data to be put in. So, you know. If you can't do it now, you might just talk to your MIS or IT and say in the future, or if you're planning to buy a new MIS system in the future, this should be on your wish list. So monitoring policy for repeat clients. Minimum, you know, monitor the use of funds. You know what? It doesn't matter that they're a second, third, fourth, fifth cycle client. You still need to see that they use the money what they said they would use it. And maybe just quarterly calls if you're comfortable with them. Again, I would say you have to visit the client once per year. There's nothing like a site visit to tell you how the client is actually doing. And of course, increased monitoring when there's diversion of funds and late payments. Some other, you know, for, for some other red flags are if the business loses one of its major customers or suppliers. You know, when you have like a call to the client and they say, oh yeah, you know, my one customer who was 50% of my sales is buying now from another uh, person or went out of business, I would start, I'd probably go visit that client the next month. If there's any incidents, you know, fire, robbery, personal problems, or if there's any changes in the management also that can be indicative of something that needs to be increased monitoring. So let's talk about forms. I'm not saying these are the best. I just took a couple that I have um, and I threw them into this presentation. I'm going to look for more so we can send these out. For smaller loans, 
you know, we'll talk about the difference between monitoring forms or monitoring information for smaller forms or smaller loans compared to larger loans. Uh, but as you can see in this form, you know, really we're looking, number one, is the borrower present? Because that is the most frustrating thing for me when I worked with loan officers and find out they go visit a client and the borrower hasn't been at the site in his store maybe for three months that they've called him or they visited. So I don't want, the borrower needs to have meet the client at the business at least once. So here you see they're looking at the visual appearance. Um, I like question number five. I, this is actually one of my favorite questions. I always ask a client for small loans, is it easy for you to make the loan payment at the, when it's due? You know, that you have enough money at the end of the month to make the loan payment or whenever the payment is due. And, you know, this is interesting. I find clients who say, no, it's not easy. Then they'll start comparing what we had said their projected sales in surplus was going to be compared to what their actual projected sales in surplus. And I always find a major difference. Clients will be honest with you if it's going to be easy or not. And that could be indicative if they have a very tight cash flow. If it's not easy for them to make this payment, it could be indicative that there's a problem to come um, and that they're trying to do some uh, something to, to, to get the payment or get it together. So questions eight and nine are, again, comparing projected to actual monthly. So it's really important for you, and one thing I want to point out for loan officers and to branch managers is to know what was projected. Look, if you have access to the file and what was in the original approved analysis, you should know what they projected per month for sales. So you can see when they tell you how much is the actual current monthly, you can see is there a big difference. Um, 10, 11, 12, 13 is just a little bit of financial information talking to them about cash, if they have receivables, inventory, or any payables. So this is the loan form for small loans. Now for large loans, this is one that um, I took. I like this, this is the reasons I like this form. Well first of all, as you can see on the top, it has visit, number, and date. You can actually have put a couple put comments from a couple of visits for different months that are different times you're out visiting. Again, you know, you always have the, the uh, borrower present. But in the second, what I like about this, this form, now for larger loans, as we all know with smaller loans, there's always smaller loans, smaller businesses, personal and business are mixed, right? For larger loans, when there is a true separate business from the personal, from the family, it's, it's more financial based, right? It's more cash flow based that we're looking at this. So for, the, for monitoring larger loans, there's going to be a more focus on looking at the cash flow and the financial information. So as you see, the second column is the original cash flow. Then it looks at projected and original, actual. So then you can actually see if there's any difference in sales, expenses, cash in hand, um, and then you look at, you can talk with the client about the relationships with customers, competition, expenditures. And if your larger loans are risk graded, then you can talk about the risk grade and if there's follow-up if there's follow -up needed. This is not extensive at, by any means, this form, but I just wanted to show a couple and show what I thought were some good, good practices in each. Now, if you put this in your MIS system, you may not be able to include all this information or questions in there. This is why you use this kind of form to train your loan officers of what information to get in the field, and then you can train them how succinctly, in a few sentences, to be able to say sales are under budget, sales are per the budget in original analysis. Sales you know, are under budget because the client, um, you know, had a death in the family and had to close the store for one week. Uh, you know, you, again, one thing I find with loan officers and even myself is I had somebody who trained me well and they need training of what information to put in an MIS system to get to the point. The worst thing I want is, the, the thing I hate seeing when I, when I see like underwriting analyses or even on monitoring forms, good client, good client. I can't tell you how many times I get that comment in, some, in written format. And good client tells me nothing. How is this a good client? 
Is it a good client because, I don't know, he's very nice? Is he a good client because his cash flow is good? Is he good because he pays early? I don't know. So I really don't like when I see good clients in anything, in an in underwriting analysis, in a monitoring form. Um, can you tell? I don't like good clients. So let's talk about the obvious. And what is the obvious? The obvious is loan officers and business development officers will always tell me, I don't have time to visit. I have these goals, and our institution wants to grow 25%, 30%, 50%. And yes, I know they're under a lot of pressure. And when I look at a loan officers and business development officer, sometimes I'll ask them when I do trainings. I say, okay, I want you, before I even come out, to look in the next week how much time you spend on business development, how much you spend on underwriting, how much you spend on monitoring performing clients and how much you end up monitoring delinquent clients. Normally I have to say a lot of times it's 50 to 75 percent underwriting and business development and then 50 to, depending on the par, 50 to 25 percent monitoring, monitoring delinquent clients. I don't see a lot of monitoring of performing clients. And this is where when I do a training or I work with loan officers, business development officers, we always have an ongoing discussion. And I have to prove to them that these monitoring visits are a risk management tool. And it's a risk mitigant. And, and we need them, loan officers and business development officers, to learn that they're also risk managers. So one thing I want to say on the slide is what I tell my loan officers when I've managed a team is I don't want a surprise. I do not want a surprise. So if there's going to be a client's going to have a payment problem, I want to know that a month ahead of time or two months ahead of time if they're having problems. No surprises. The worst thing I've had happen to me was I was out uh, doing a loan review for a client and we literally went to a store and it was closed up and the next, we went to go talk to the neighbor to the next door uh, business and they informed us, oh, He's been gone, I don't know, he hasn't been open in a, at least a month or two, and rumor has it he moved. Oh, I mean, that, that was a surprise, and that was a very bad surprise, and that client, yes, it went into arrears, and that client had moved. So, no surprises, that's what you do tell your loan officers. So let's talk about the monitoring policy of problem clients, some things that I think would be good. Within the policy, we should outline very specific procedures and actions. We should put in actually number of days. We should say what documentation is required. We should provide the forms for them so they, they have a clear idea of what documentation is required. And we should discuss in there also what the management oversight is that. So here is this, you know, I'm not just going to show you my collection workout flow chart. You know, here is the, I guess we have to say it's, uh, you know, we can't be too strict. I mean, we need to tell loan officers, let's say, between 1 to 29 days, you have to call and visit if the client's not paying, right? We can't, you know, what I have found if we are too strict and tell them on day two you call, well, they don't call on day one. You know, they call on day two. So we need to be a little bit flexible, but that's the, the idea of also training and mentoring your loan officers so that they know okay, this client is always one or two days late, or we know this client is out of the country, or uh, maybe outgoing and not and no, told us that won't be able to pay us on day one or two, so we'll call them on day three or four. Again, this is, you know, getting these loan officers and business development officers and these monitoring officers to think critically of what to do. So this is just this collection workout flow chart, you know, I was just saying between 29, 1 to 29 days, it's really kind of the loan officer's focus, including the branch manager. But really, after 30 days, after 29 days, it should turn over to the branch manager, working with the loan officer, but it should be on the branch manager's head. So the branch manager needs to be working with them, and usually, you know, send a delinquency letter, right? And then, after about 45, maybe 60 days, it goes to a collections department. <clears throat> so here's my question. <clears throat> you know, I've worked with institutions where loan officers have been the collection officer. So the loan always stayed with the, with the, with the loan officer, right, in the branch. Um, and then I've seen also where we set up a separate collections department. So the loan, after a certain amount of days, went to the, co went to the collection department. 
I will tell you over and over and over again and debate you, having a collection department is absolutely required and a best practice. Um, recently, or actually right now, I'm working with a financial institution who, where the loan stayed with the loan officer and the branch manager until it was written off. <clears throat> there was a legal department that was worked with that would help in assisting sending out the legal documents and legal letters, but really the responsibility in actual collections was the loan officer. Now guess what? We are setting up a collections department and we are now first going to look at the written off loans. And what we found out was the loan officers, especially with lo with with lo with lo borrowers that they were had good relationships with, were very lenient. They didn't hold out to sending the letters on time, pressuring them as such. And you know, that's where we learned the biggest lesson is it was the right thing to set up a collections department because at some point, and I know it as a loan officer, you get almost too close to the client. You believe what they're telling you and having another person, another department involved that takes it over, that can look at it very critically without prejudice is very important. So having a separate collections department is very important. We can have an ongoing debate if that should be centralized collection or if it should be out in the branch, there should be a collection officer. But I truly believe that there needs to be a collections department. Um, and so with this flow chart, it just to tells you that, you know, then the collections department works on it a few days and then it goes to legal where they push and then they go after liquidation of collateral. Something like this flow chart would be good to actually have in your policy, something so you know, vis visibly they can see it. But also using this flow chart, you can work with your MIS. This is what I've done too, is to show them, okay, between one and 29 days, I need these kind of fields. You know, what is, what is done? And then I need a checkbox at, 40, at 45 days that the first delinquency letter went out. And then I need at you know, 90 days another check that has to be completed or load up of a, or scanning of a letter that the second delinquency file. So you get to work, IT, IT, MIS people love flow charts and then you can indicate where you need to put in the data. They need to create fields in the MIS system to put in the data. So I think I've talked about many of these things in this last slide. We want to provide an outline with days, but we need to be flexible also. So, you know, I said day one to three, call the client, day 15, visit the client. But of course we can say day, you know, up to, up to day 15, visit the client, up to day 25, branch manager should visit the client. Day 30 though, the default letter needs to be sent. I think we need to be very strict when it comes to default letters. Um, because in many countries I found you have to send one, two default letters before then you can start the legal process. So with something like that, that needs to be strict. And that's why having a good MIS system where you're going to have it, the box ticked off that the default letter was sent also lets head office know and anybody who's monitoring at a higher level that this loan is 35 days late and this letter has gone out. So, and then I want to talk about day 60 down here because I say second default letter sent, that's just tentative, and then a problem asset committee to review loans over a certain size. I'm going to talk about that in the next slide, but one thing I say that there needs to be a strict guideline to when the file needs to be sent off to collections because what I have found is that if there's not a strict saying after 60 days or 45 days, the file is sent to collections to be handled, loan officers will hold on to this file. And yes, I was that way. We had a problem asset department, a collections department, but I would hold on to the file and finally, we didn't have a strict deadline um, when the file needed to be sent, but my team leader was very good at usually the 45 days or even 30 days saying to me, the client's not it's time to let this file go to this problem asset committee, or to, sorry, problem asset department, to the collections department. You can't do any more on this. So then I would have to send it over. Oh, this is a watch list, and I want to talk about this. I also, you know, you have the monitoring, and then you should have at a higher level list of these loans, right? And one is a watch list. Um, and it could be 30 days, all loans go on it, or maybe 15 days or 20 days, or before. For example, on day, if a client hasn't paid on day one, 
Or let's say even the client calls you 10 days before the payment and says, I'm not going to make it. I'm having cash flow. You can have a, a watch list of lists of loans that you're just watching. Or maybe even clients that are current, maybe larger loans that are current, that have told you, I'm having cash flow problems. I can make this month's payment. I can make next month's payment. But I'm not sure after that. So a higher level, maybe larger loans that are just being watched by senior management can be developed. I like this. Uh, we had a watch list at my bank, and I really I thought it was very appropriate. And I put it in place at some financial institutions and think that these, these watch lists can be work very well. So remember the two slides I talked about problem asset committee. So what is this problem asset committee? It's not a department. It's usually comprised of senior staff members, usually the head of credit, usually the CFO, maybe the risk manager, maybe a head of lending. And they make strategic decisions regarding delinquent loans over a certain loan size, not the tiny, tiny loans, but larger ones. And what they're making decisions on are like workout strategies, including restructuring. Um, they also review PAR and credit reports, and they'll make recommendations on policies, procedures, and credit methodologies. So what is happening here is maybe a large loan moves to the problem asset department, the collections department, and they're working it out. And the client's like, well, you know, my cash flow has, I lost my largest customer, my cash flow slow, so I'd like to have interest only for maybe three to six months. You know, that should not be made in a vacuum, especially if it's a large loan. That decision needs to be at a higher authority. And this senior staff up here will, you know, credit, CFO, risk manager, this problem asset committee will meet usually on a monthly basis and look at these larger loans and decide, yes, we agree with this workout strategy, or you, you know what, no, we need to move to liquidation of collateral. We found this at a bank to be very effective to make the right decisions at the right time um, to either move forward with liquidation of collateral or restructuring, maybe some refinancing. Uh, but this was a really good set of, I don't know, six, eight eyes at a very much higher level making decisions. And people that are outside of the lending department, the CFO and the risk manager usually, this isn't the credit risk manager, it's the risk manager at a higher level make, helping make these decisions. So why would you have, like I said, why would you have this committee? Again, six, eight eyes. Not all that are lending, making the strategic decisions that are going to, you know, especially for larger loans that might be looking at the financial impact of the institution. If you're liquidating, you know, or you're going to be writing something off in the future, they would be looking at something like that. So tracking, monitor, tracking monitoring, you know, again, loan officers, you can tell them to monitor, you can put it in the policy, but if you're not tracking it, or you're not putting it in their uh, KPIs, then they might not be doing it. So you need someone to monitor it. Best practice is so you have it in the system so the manager could download a report and see that Donna Nails, the loan officer, did monitoring of three clients in the last week or three or four, three, four days. And they all, you know, managers should also do their own monitoring. They should also do their own surprise visits to clients, um, not just to large clients, but to clients of all sizes, just to, you know, and see how the how if the loan officer is doing what he's saying or she is doing, visiting clients, and also just get to understand what's out in the field. I don't like when managers. I understand managers need to stay in the office, approve things, oversee, you know, operations, so forth. But they need to also get out in the field. And Donna, managers. You, oh, sorry. A quick question about that. In in terms of, you know, you've talked about some of the senior management and then the more of the middle managers. Um, and maybe you can talk about this either either now or during the discussion period, but. You know, how do you get the loan officers then to do very quality monitoring? You know, a lot of loan officers are are thinking more about their numbers and you know, selling loans, renewing loans. Um, but how do you get the loan officers to actually do the monitoring and then to do very, very quality monitoring? Hmm. Uh, good question. I mean, that's that one slide about the obvious. You know, loan officers and business development officers debate me all the time. I don't have time to do it. And if they do it, they just drive past maybe a store. And again, it's training. 
getting them to understand it, and then also putting it maybe within the loan officer's KPIs also, that they, in their performance, that they have to do the monitoring and it's going to be checked. You know, either internal audit or credit or their managers is going to be checking. And if you have a good MIS system, you could also then see how many, how many visits they've done and what their quality of reporting on it. So again, it's, you know, again, when I was a loan officer and I wasn't, it wasn't part of my performance criteria to monitor and no one was actually watching over me, I, I have to be honest, when I was a junior loan officer, I wasn't doing it and I wasn't doing it right either. So it's training and then it's also coming up with the systems, either uh, preferably an MIS, training them how to do a quality uh, going out with them and actually mentoring them. I mean, that's what I used to do with some of my loan officers. I would go to the clients. I would, I would show them how to do. You know, I'd ask the questions. I would be probing um, and, and and show them how that uh, a good quality uh, monitoring visit would go. And then and then I would write up the monitoring visit to show them how you should write it up. What I learned and how in four sentences I can write up what I saw there. But again, then management needs to track it and needs to be also on top of it. The frustrating thing for me is when I don't see loan officers monitoring and I talk to a branch manager and the branch manager is like, well, you know, I, they, they do it. They tell me they do it. So the branch manager is not monitoring it either. So it's a whole system that has to be set up. Um, training, setting up the tools, mentoring, and then the oversight by the managers. Uh, thanks for that question. So my final comments, have a monitoring policy, you know, st stress the verification of use, but have different, of course, criteria for performing and non-performing clients. You have to train them and mentor the staff on monitoring and how to document it, really. You know, it's almost you have to go out and you do it for them. You let them watch you, see how to do a good monitoring call, and then you document and show them how to write it up. And lastly, like we don't don't forget about the oversight, um, and that we should, as managers, also be ensuring that it's happening. And we should probably put in the managers' KPIs that they do some monitoring and that they're monitoring it. No surprises. That should be the biggest motto that you should tell all your loan officers. I don't want surprises. And if you're doing correct monitoring, we won't have many surprises. And uh, that's it. Um, Jessica, I will turn it over to you. Excellent. Donna, thank you so much for that. And um, we are going to start the discussion period now. So we've had a couple of questions come in. Um, if you'd like, I can either unmute your microphone and you can ask the question directly to Donna or else you can post the question for me and I will ask it um, directly directly to Donna. So whatever works works best for you. So uh, I'm going to unmute one of our partners. Um, uh, Tatiana, are you there? Yes, I'm there. Can you hear me? Yes, we can Hello. hear you. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Tatiana Lavrinyuk. I am from Asian Credit Fund, which is microfinance organization in Kazakhstan. I'm working now as a business development project coordinator, but before I worked as deputy director at the same organization. I would like to thank you, Donna, at first for sharing this information with us because, you know, monitoring is it's always a headache for managers, I think, because loan officers prefer not to do it. <laughs> uh, they prefer to disburse loans and receive bonuses, and we always need to like track <laughs> this monitoring how if they do it or yeah, and how they do it. Uh, and I was uh, a loan officer maybe for ten years, and I I can confirm that what Donna you said it is really good practice, and uh, it works very well, especially uh, within individual lending program. But my question is about uh, group lending program. Before, because now since the crisis started in 2008, our organization uh, moved to group lending program. You know, when uh, uh, 10, for example, or 5 uh, women, uh, they form one group, and, uh, but they receive small loans 
and usually it is shown short term loans. And my question is uh, should monitoring policy for group loans uh, be different from the individual one? Because you know, productivity for uh, individual loan officer and for group loan officer, it's it's different. Individual loan officer can have productivity 100 client and group loan officer 400 client. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. monitoring doesn't work. <laughs> yeah, no, 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 no. I get it. Um, so you know. Group lending, you know, uh, I've seen it done a couple different ways. One is where there's the weekly meeting of the groups. Uh, that, of course, is the monitoring visit, right, if the people show up. You get suspicious if there's one person that consistently misses, and then you have to, I found loan officers will go, and if they miss maybe two or three meetings, they'll go out to see them. If you're not requiring the monthly or the weekly or even monthly meetings, I would say, yeah, you, you would need, though, Okay, of course, I would say within probably a new loan to a new group, you would require them to meet, say, once all before the disbursements, to talk with them briefly right before, or I'm sorry, right, not before disbursement, sorry, right before the first loan payment, just to kind of meet with them like a ver verification or a discussion just to reconfirm when the loans are due, the terms of the loan. And I would say then, yeah, I mean, uh, I would try to meet with them at least once a year, you know, if they're probably short term, 12 months, try to visit each of them or at least have a group, like call one, the leader of the group to tell them to all meet in one place at one store or one area to meet. That That's probably a good practice. At least just talk with them. It's also tell your loan officers, as you know this, Tatiana, it's a marketing, making sure that they're happy with the product, that they're going to ask for a new loan once they repay this loan off, if they're good clients, um, of course. So, you know, that that's that's what I would recommend with group. But group, yeah, is, is very different. You're, you're very, very right about that. Okay. Thank Thanks you for that pointing that out. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Um, and then, Donna, we also had a question, if we could go back to the forms, um, the form slide, maybe you can just talk about the difference in sizes that you're thinking about for the, the small versus um, large, large loans. Okay. <laughs> Somebody's very smart out there who answered this question. <laughs> um, so what I'm thinking for those... Uh, I guess, sorry, I'm trying to get to those forms but it's taking a while. So what I, I guess I just think about small and large, let, let's talk about the type of client. So I guess for me what I'm thinking about is there's one loan form I think about for clients that where they, oh, I think, I think, okay, sorry, I'm just trying to get to them, where I, I'm going to do it this way, here we go, there we go. Okay, so I don't like this, I, I, maybe small and large wasn't right to put it, like the way I'd like to think about it is what I'm equating small loans here is the borrowers where they mix the family and the business funds. So it's the guy that maybe it's one person business or maybe he includes, uh, he includes like another person that, or he's taking all the money home. So he doesn't give himself a salary, right? He, all the money at the end of the month, all the surplus is actually all his money, right, that he uses at home, you know, that, 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 that will disappear. With larger loans, and usually we say yes and these, you know, the client normally, hopefully, will give themselves a salary. So they're not pulling all the money out of the business. Or it's very separate from the family expenses. Um, so that's how I think about it. And, and usually with larger clients, they're doing some kind of financial statements. Um, they're doing at least a basic income statement, maybe even a balance sheet. So they are, they are more sophisticated in their reporting. The smaller loans, they're just, you know, they have, probably it's a store that has a ledger that they just put the sales in. And then, the, you know, if I talk to the client, he'll hand me the, the, the invoices from where he bought his Coke or where he bought his potato chips, you know. He doesn't have formal expense and income statement. So that's the other way to look at it is that the larger clients or, you know, more sophisticated um, clients will use this larger loan form where you can really break out 
and even do ratios. I mean, with my more sophisticated clients, and that do really very good financial statements. Maybe they have even a financial person working in their in their institution. I will then, you know, actually put monitor some ratios. I will look at their um, their accounts receivables and their inventory turnover. And you can really monitor that with the SME loans. You know, if they're inventory turnover is getting larger the days like you know they're not turning their inventory as soon so hopefully that answers answer yours answers your question great very helpful um, and I'm I'm going to unmute another one of our participants today um, Delgar Delgar Jagar can you hear me okay yes Yes. Okay. I I know you. Um, you had a couple questions. Um, do you do you want to uh, pose your questions directly to to Donna? Uh, yes. Uh, thank you. Uh, this is Vigita from Hasbank Mongolia, which is the one of the uh, the leading uh, for commercial bank in the country. Uh, if you could just speak up just a little louder for us. I am the VP of uh, the Chief Retail Banking Officer. So. In our case, my question is related not to only the loan as it's about in, uh, the loan documents which is kept in the loan file. So, for example, so we the uh, our the loan file it's about in six to hundred pages of documents. This is our business, most of them, which includes uh, those, uh, for example, the verification documents, which is the track of. Uh, Sales, uh, baby sales taking, and then a copy of those documents, bank statement, or verification of the uh, uh, business premises, and etc. So uh, this is the very useless. And the, then I, I ask the, how we can uh, reduce these documents and uh, to make it more efficient, because it's uh, those that we need to. Uh, keep those many documents, and also it needs the more premises and uh, archiving, and it's uh, so operational. It's not efficient. So, in your experience, the what type of documents are they must be kept in the long documents, long file? Uh, uh, second uh, question is related to monitoring. So, as I have, uh, as you mentioned about that. Uh, is the monitoring forms need to be filled, uh, uh, filled, and also the also the told or the uh, mentioned about it so for how the loan monitoring to be made. It's a monthly after disbursement or uh, the on-site basis, etc. But how it is efficient and for those very small loans, especially for micro and uh, micro loans, it's about an 1,000 VC to 5,000 or 10,000 VC equal loans. So as we understand, also the retail loans are uh, the monitored by the for uh, for for example, risk management in this type of thing uh, made by the uh, the risk portfolio uh, management. So we see the, all the, the so we analyze uh, those loans and based on the portfolio. So if there is the issue related to, for example, the, uh, to make the more deep analysis and etc. So then, uh, based on those analysis, it, the loan terms and conditions or the criteria for the borrowers are uh, the revised. So revised and improved. So how do you see about that? The, about the monitoring to make it then efficient. So Donna, I think that the the two questions I know we um, had some audio issues there uh, are are both about efficiency. So the first one is about you know efficiency in terms of the loan documents that need to be included in a file. Um, you know, they they can they tend to be quite large uh, in terms of the the number of files that are there, and you know when it when it comes to monitoring a lot of the information that we get at the beginning in terms of a lease agreement or bank statements are not really useful for monitoring going forward. So, what's the best way to make these these loan files efficient 
um, speaking you know about some of the retail loans and then on the other side it's um, you know how to be efficient in monitoring for some of these smaller loans you know loans up to ten thousand dollars in terms of time spent on, on monitoring yeah yeah okay documentation this is this is a painful subject for me <laughs> and the reason it's painful is you know in my perfect credit risk world my risk management hat I want every document kept right but I realize in my real world uh, we want to make a profit we don't want to have you know buildings and buildings full of useless documents um, you know that that is that is why our forms such as this one that I have up that if we can put a few visits on there um, and teach our loan officers to succinctly write the most important information that's important and also updating your MIS this is the perfect argument to working with your MIS now if or in the future to make sure you can document some of this and you know those lease agreements and those financial statements or bank statements, you know, you know what's painful for me is I have gone back and used those bank statements once in a while when the client has misused funds or not misused funds but diverted funds and used it for something else or, you know, the cash flow doesn't work. I take these bank statements, I'll say, well, this is, you know, this is what you, you were showing me last year. You know, why is why is something changed? But I, I understand. I mean, I think, you know, Keeping all the documents, oh, you're gonna, you're not gonna like what I'm gonna say, but really, you almost want to keep them during the life of the loan, and then, you know, maybe when you do a new loan, just at least keep the credit information, and then you've got to update that, you know, new bank statements and something. Um, this is coming from my risk management hat, though, and uh, but your your institution will have to make that discussion. And regarding the efficiency of doing the smaller loans, this is why I said. You know, do one verification of use and then just phone calls if needed. And then maybe one more site visit for a new loan um, during that time. If it's less than like 12 months, try to go visit at least six months if it's not far away. I mean, loan officers can also cluster, you know, their, mo their monitoring visits. That's one thing I talk to them when they complain to me, oh, I don't have time, I got goals, la, la, la. You know, I say, well, cluster them together. We can do four or five, you know, and you teach them, you tell them, you know, for small clients, you really should not take more than 15, 20 minutes. 15 minutes if the client looks it's performing, if they, if they, if they answer the questions right, they've been performing on time. You know, 20 minutes if you, make, you sense there's something wrong. I mean, you've got to teach them. You go in, you ask the questions, and then you leave. And this is, you quickly, efficiently teach them how to do their monitoring visits. Um, hopefully I answered your question there. Okay, thank you. Great. Uh, we're going to take one more um, quick question and then finish up. And I would just like to mention if you do have follow-up questions for Donna, um, you know, or for Capital Plus Exchange, please feel free to send those over to us. We will post a question on our LinkedIn page and our LinkedIn group. And so if you want to continue the discussion there, we will um, continue talking about some of loan monitoring as well as sending out some of these, these forms and templates for your team to use as well. And if your institution is interested in some of this capacity building uh, in loan monitoring, please make sure that you reach out to us as well, either via the, uh, the poll that you're doing after the webinar or by getting in touch with me directly because we're happy to support you in that. So just one quick last question, Donna, in terms of the, uh, the collection workout flowchart. Um, is this appropriate for larger institutions, I'm sorry, larger clients or only for um, individual clients with, with smaller or more personal loans? Um, we had a, a participant from Zimbabwe uh, mention that this this uh, collection flowchart may be better for the the smaller institutions um, as opposed to the larger institutions where you know where the the bank is still trying to nurture and maintain and and grow that relationship over a number of years. So just going back to that, if you had any thoughts in terms of you know where the flowchart is is best used. 
I, I'm not sure if I, under the, if I understand the question. I think the question was probably the nine. Maybe the client, the the, the person was asking, um, maybe leaving the loan with the loan officer longer than transferring it to a collections department is appropriate. Is that is that? I I'm going to go with that question. That's what I'm going to go with. Um, a good question. Zimbabwe. I think I know what what financial institution you're from, and you're a very good institution. Yeah, with with smaller SME with with, with SME loans, uh, larger loans. Uh, yes, you can leave it with the loan officer for a bit longer time, with very good oversight though from management, because like I was doing larger loans. And I was keeping the loan with me, and I'm trying to think now from my banking days, over 60 days, uh, probably almost to 90. But there was times where the client wasn't answering my calls, was giving me, can I say, um, not honest answers. Oh, I'll get you the payment next week. Oh, I'll get you the payment the next week. And my team leader would weekly talk to me, okay, what did the client say? When are they going to pay? And then finally, I think, you know, after 65, 70 days, my team leader would say, it's time to give it to collections. You know what? You are not making any improvement on this client. This person is telling you the same old story. I've called them and they don't return it. They need somebody else. You know, what this comes down to is the client's willingness to pay and the client's um, ability to pay. You know, when the client isn't willing to pay, it's a character issue, right? And at that point, if you realize that early enough, sometimes those people with the character flaws need a bit of legal push, a de deficient a, a, de a fault letter, a le a, somebody from legal contacting them. So yes, I, I agree. You can keep it in maybe larger loans with the loan officer with close oversight, but also teach your loan officers and your management to understand if it's a not if they have the cash, the client, and they're not paying you then it needs to be moved to a collections department quicker to move on legal action. And let me tell you, a lot of those unwilling clients who have money willingly start paying when that default letter or when you start the process of liquidation. So hopefully that answered your question, Zimbabwe. If not, then you know, forward it and um, I, can, I can try to answer it via email. Great. Well, Donna, thank you so much for a, a very excellent second part of this. We will be sending through the video of this session as well, um, and you can access part one already on our website. Um, and we'll also be sending through some of those forms and templates that we talked about as well. So, Donna, thank you again so much, and uh, please follow our uh, discussion session on our LinkedIn group. Um, after after this uh, webinar today as well. So thank you everyone and thank you to Donna.